Empty Space An original sci-fi short story Audiobook format Written by Mary Lovelace Forward For most people, the vastness of outer space is impossible to truly appreciate. Even the most imaginative minds, will rarely come close to correctly visualizing, just how impossibly huge, this empty void of nothingness, really, truly is. Only when you've experienced it, and seen it with your own eyes, by living on board a starship, traveling at the speed of light, will your mind, ever begin to truly get a taste, of the absurdly, mind-bogglingly, gargantuan vastness of what outer space is really like. How do I know this? Well, I've spent a lot of my life living and traveling in outer space. I was just 11 years old when I first stepped aboard the gigantic exploration starship, Fusion, with mom, dad, and my kid brother Danny, who was just 8 at the time. My parents were ambitious officers in the Space Division of the International Science Corps, and had trained with hundreds of other scientists for over six years, to be a part of this, the biggest, boldest space mission, in human history. The fusion was supposed to be our home for nine years, give or take. Its mission, to travel away from the Earth, and cross our galaxy to investigate the possibility we may have some friendly space neighbors, after signs of intelligent life had been discovered, a subspace radio signal coming from one particular region of what our parents call, our neighborhood? That was five years ago. Right now, as I write this, I'm on an alien spacecraft, heading back toward Earth. Danny is fast asleep beside me, and I remain amazed, but very grateful we are both still alive. When we reach Earth in two years' time, we are hoping to help these wonderful, benevolent aliens who saved us, make first contact with our home world. My name is Lucas Knight, by the way, and this is my story. Chapter 1 At first, it was the most exciting thing in the world. Imagine telling a young kid, he was going to live in space, on board a giant starship. I don't think I slept more than a few hours a night for the entire week leading up to the launch of the fusion. It felt like Christmas Eve every night, only ten times more exciting. Unfortunately, despite all the excitement, the amazing preparation training they gave us, and the promise of the experience of a lifetime, the actual reality of life on board the starship was considerably different to my expectations, especially when it came to the attitudes of a lot of the people on board. It took less than a week for the novelty factor to wear off, and after a month on board the ship, I decided I hated it, and I wanted to go home, badly. I soon came to realize that whilst on board the fusion, I was mostly experiencing just three types of emotions, fear, anxiety, and intimidation. Family members were only allowed in certain areas of the ship, but the off-limit areas were not well defined or marked. Several times I had accidentally wandered into restricted areas, and got shouted at by angry people I didn't know. I remember often feeling annoyed at those who designed the layout of the ship, not understanding how something as simple as marking out restricted areas, could be overlooked. Dad calmly pointed out to me over family dinner, that it was designed that way, in order to keep the available areas flexible for different uses. Despite his logical explanation, it still sucked, because knowing the reasons, didn't help at all. I still often inadvertently wandered into restricted zones, and I still got shouted at. To add to the pressure, all around the ship were constant reminders of the terrifying, potentially life-threatening dangers facing us. On every corridor were emergency stations designed to deal with everything, from radiation hazards, to being boarded by hostile aliens. Some corridors even had boxes with labels, indicating they contained body bags. Until I arrived on board the Fusion, I had never seen a real-life beam weapon. There were armed security personnel posted all over the ship. They all carried beam energy sidearms with them, in holsters strapped to their legs. 
I remember dad telling me about beam weapons, and how they could vaporize you in just milliseconds, if turned up to full power. Being in such close proximity to these terrifying devices, was something I never got used to. Like lots of kids my age, I had an overactive imagination, and once on board the fusion, many of my waking, and sleeping moments, started to become tainted with the nightmarish dread of these weapons being turned on me, if I got into trouble, or did something wrong. Apart from the body bags, for me, these energy weapons were one of the most intimidating aspects of being on the ship. I soon found myself trying to stay well away from the guards, as a matter of routine. I ended up growing an overwhelming aversion to them, which grew into a kind of phobia, that dominated my thoughts, and helped make my life even more miserable. Whenever I passed a guard in a corridor, I would find myself giving him or her a very wide berth, putting as much distance between us as was physically possible, hurrying past as quickly as I could. It didn't matter if the guards looked friendly, smiled, nodded, or even said hello, I would still speed up, and hurry past quickly, cowering as I ran, and not looking back. I should have realized such behavior, was only going to draw attention. One day a guard called out for me to stop, after I'd hurried past him. I immediately went into panic mode, as I found myself torn between running away, and doing what the guard said. But then the thought fell into my head, that if I ran away, he might shoot me with his beam gun. With that thought, I became genuinely unable to run, frozen to the spot, in absolute terror. It turns out the guard, who we later came to know as, Chuck, was just being friendly, and curious. He approached me, crouched to my eye level, and asked in a kindly voice, why I always looked so scared every time I walked past him, or his colleagues. All I could think about, and focus on, was the beam weapon I could clearly see strapped to his side, just inches away from me. My irrational fears had rendered me completely unable to move or speak. I could hear the pounding of my own heartbeat inside my ears, as the panic increased. I just stood there, visibly trembling, my breathing labored, the thought of being imminently vaporized playing over and over again, in my mind. Chuck could see the look of total panic and terror in my tearing up eyes, and he grew concerned. Hey, it's okay, what's the matter? Kid? Why are you so frightened? He asked in a friendly, compassionate tone. But I couldn't answer him, even if I wanted to, the terror had rendered me mute. I just stared the whole time at the dreadful weapon strapped to his side, as the color slowly drained from my face, and I started to feel lightheaded, thinking I might pass out. A few moments later, Danny came running up the corridor toward us. It's your beam gun he called, pointing. Danny reached us, and quickly explained to Chuck, as best he could, in the words of an eight-year-old, that I was terrified of being in such close proximity, to his energy weapon. Chuck immediately stood straight, and backed off. Oh man! Sorry kid! He gasped, suddenly realizing he was the one responsible for putting me into this state of terror. I didn't know! I never loved my kid brother more, than in that moment. I was so grateful for Danny intervening, rescuing me. The guard instructed Danny to take me to wherever I was headed, and to look after me until I felt alright again. Danny, bless him, he stayed with me for the rest of the morning, doing his best to look after me, and make sure I was okay, but the reality was, I was a long way from being okay. Chapter 2 Mom and Dad could see I was not settling in. The same could be said for Danny. Even though externally, he seemed to be handling things a little better than I was, he was still a long way from being happy. Danny was already a timid kid, even before we arrived on the ship, and our new surroundings really weren't helping him at all. He was clearly having a hard time adjusting. Back home on Earth, me and Danny usually got on quite well. Sure, we argued and bickered sometimes, like all siblings do, but as kid brothers go, we have always been very close. 
Danny cares a lot about others, he always has done. He's one of those naturally altruistic kids, with a big heart, who'd give up his most cherished toy in a heartbeat, if he thought it would help someone. Mom often described him as having, an old soul. If ever we argued, he'd always be the first one to extend the olive branch, and make peace, usually within minutes, because he couldn't bear anyone, especially us, to be at odds with each other. During our first few weeks on board the Fusion, Danny quickly became my shadow, and my new best, best friend. We found a great deal of mutual comfort in each other's company. The times we spent together, tended to be times when we would relax and play, without that nagging sense of fear in the back of our minds. We would often spend hours in our family quarters, or in one of the empty cargo bays, engaged in pure imagination-based games, games that took us as far away from our current reality as possible, and put us back home, on the earth we both missed so much. One of our favorite games, was to turn a table upside down, so it became a makeshift boat. We tied cloths onto the legs, and pretended to sail the oceans of the earth, or other planets, on great, imaginary voyages of discovery, just like the great explorers from history. Storage boxes, textiles, pieces of furniture, or whatever else was lying around, would suddenly become props integral to the plot, taking on the role of caves, islands, vehicles, or any places worthy of discovery, and adventure. Our fantasy journeys of escape, were a welcome respite from our reality, but they were always over too quickly, at which time the semi-permanent background fear and anxiety, would return. Three months into the voyage, an opportunity for us to leave the ship, and return to Earth, did present itself. A shuttle was scheduled to leave the Fusion, prior to the giant starship exiting the Earth's solar system, and engaging her faster than light speed engines. Mom and Dad, torn between their massive, once in a lifetime, work commitments, and their family life, agonized for days over the decision, to let us return home, and live with our aunt and uncle in England, for the duration of the mission. Eventually, they told us, they would let us return, if it's what we really, truly, wanted to do. But in hindsight, I think they said it, knowing deep down in our hearts, Danny and I both wouldn't really leave. Despite all the bad things we felt, they knew the prospect, of not seeing our parents again for nine years, was unthinkable to us. Our biggest problem, was just attracting their attention. They were so absorbed in their work, they hadn't seemed to notice the true extent of what we were going through, or how we were feeling. We tried discussing our fears and problems with them, on many occasions. Each time, they looked like they were listening, but they did little to engage the issues we were raising, offering only the standard parental words of reassurance, dismissing much of what we said, as just our imaginations, and assuring us that everything will settle down, if we just give it some time. They often seemed so distant, with their thoughts so focused on their work, that in reality, I don't think half of what we told them, even registered. It was deeply frustrating for both of us. We started to feel like orphans, like we'd lost both our parents to their job. Eventually, it was the sheer frustration, that pushed us into changing our tactics, to something more drastic, to try and get their attention. I told Danny in secret what I was planning to do, and he agreed to play along. I was going to make them believe, we were both adamant that we'd chosen to leave, and head back to Earth on the shuttle, in the hope it might finally get them to notice us, and what we were going through. The plan was simple, at the last moment, we would tell them we'd changed our minds, and would be staying. The plan might have been simple, but actioning it was a lot harder than I anticipated. I really didn't enjoy playing this deception, and I felt uncomfortable lying to them, but I felt like I had little choice. My anger and frustration at the whole situation, did make it easier to go through with it, however, and to my surprise, the plan started to work. For the first time in a long time, we captured the complete and undivided attention of our parents. As the penny finally dropped, 
that they might be losing their children for the next nine years, for the rest of our childhoods. However, once we realized we finally got their full attention, my defiance and anger quickly fell away, and I caved in. I couldn't keep up the lie, and ended up an emotional sobbing wreck, as I confessed everything to them. Despite everything, we still got a result. Mom and Dad took a whole week away from their work duties, and spent some long overdue, but very appreciated, quality and meaningful time with us, a sort of family holiday, to help patch the rift that had developed between us. They also declared that they were going to start arranging regular days off, just so they could spend time with us. That was a great week, and for the first time in a very long time, it felt like we were a close family, once again. After that, things did start to settle down and improve. The ship's school finally opened, after months of delays and issues. We made new friends, and for a while, the journey didn't seem so bad anymore. The guard, Chuck, who caused me to panic in the corridor that time, got in touch with my parents, and offered, along with his colleagues, to help me with the irrational fears I had, regarding the guards, and their energy weapons. Mom and Dad agreed, and I got to regularly spend time with the guards, whilst they were unarmed, in their barrack zone. Over time, I got to know virtually all the guards, whilst learning about the things they did, and they didn't seem so scary anymore. They were actually very kind and friendly, and seemed to enjoy having me around. I found myself being adopted by them, as a kind of unofficial mascot, or as some more critical observers might suggest, pet. All the guards knew about my extreme anxiety, regarding the energy weapons, and they all went out of their way to ensure I was never exposed to their proximity, at least not until such a time that I felt ready. In the meantime, I got to do lots of exciting and fun things, like exercise training with them. Their assault course was always grueling, but great fun. They also gently nurtured me through some martial arts combat training, which really helped with my confidence. Eventually, I got to shoot some conventional weapons on their firing range, and after a few weeks of getting used to that, I finally plucked up the courage, to start reconsidering my position, regarding energy weapons. The incentive, was that I could eventually get to join them on a patrol of the ship, but obviously, I first had to tolerate being in close proximity to the beam weapons they carried as sidearms. A group of the guards, all chose to sit around me for moral support, as Chuck first showed me a fully deactivated beam gun, explaining how it all worked. He gave me time to handle it safely, and taught me how to assemble and disassemble it. I was really nervous at first, my hands were actually shaking the first few times it was shown to me, but the guards being there with me, really helped. They were constantly reassuring me, and gently helping me push through the fear, giving me the confidence to go through with it. After several brief and very measured introduction sessions like that, I began to realize, I had little to fear from these weapons, when everything was presented in such sensible context. In the following weeks, I got to watch the guards fire some live beam weapons in the firing range, firstly from behind the glass windows overlooking the range, and then, eventually, when I felt confident enough, and accompanied again by several of the guards for moral support, I entered the range, and watched from close by. My exposure to these weapons became more and more regular, but always under very controlled conditions. It happened gradually, and intentionally, over many weeks, and by the time it came to me handling a live version of the weapon, I was calm and collected. My fears had all but left me, and I actually found myself getting a little bit excited, about finally getting to fire one. Under very careful and close supervision, and with its power levels locked on a low, non-lethal stun setting, Chuck guided me through the firing range procedure for beam weapons one more time, while, unnoticed by me, the entire garrison silently filtered into the back of the shooting range, to watch. A minute later, I found my courage, and I discharged the beam weapon down the range, with the bonus of accurately hitting the target. I had done it? 
I had genuinely conquered my terror. I felt euphoric, and overwhelmed with relief. With the weapon quickly back in Chuck's hands, and made safe, I removed my ear defenders, and with a beaming smile, I quietly punched the air in celebration, still completely unaware of the forty or so guards stood silently behind me, watching. Suddenly, a really loud cheer erupted, and I spun around to see every one of the guards cheering and applauding me. They all knew how far I had come. They all knew what it meant to overcome fear, and in my case, to conquer a very real, and genuine terror. I became so overwhelmed, my beaming grin did little to stop the happy tears running down my face, as I stood there before them. The guards all hurried into the range, and gathered around me, lifting me up like a champion above their shoulders, all so proud. There were a lot of hugs, and even grown-up tears that day, as we all celebrated together, the day, I conquered my fears. That was a good day. One I'll never forget. Chapter 3 We finally settled down for the long haul, and enjoyed several fairly relaxed, and uneventful years, aboard the Fusion. Me and Danny grew up a bit more, both celebrating three birthdays each. We went to school, learned new things, made new friends, found ways to amuse ourselves and pass the time, as individuals, as brothers, and as a family, with mom and dad. Life was pretty good in most ways. Sure, there were things we missed from home, like swimming in the ocean, and going to the ball game, but there were other things we really enjoyed that we could never do at home, like zero gravity air surfing, and freestyle flying, and, well, we were in space, on a huge freaking starship, traveling at the speed of light, to potentially meet some aliens. What's not to like? Danny and I, found we didn't need to spend time escaping from fear anymore, at least not like before. We still spent a lot of time together though, not out of fear, but simply because of the great relationship we had, a lot of it, nurtured by those earlier, scary times on the fusion, that had brought us even closer together than we already were. However, in year three, our fears returned, with a vengeance. The fusion suffered an unprovoked attack, by multiple unknown hostile ships, piloted by life forms the scientists later named, Zeros. Our ship was badly damaged, and some of the crew were killed. During the attack, Mom and Dad were summoned to duty. Leaving us behind in our quarters, seemed like the hardest decision they had ever made. They were torn, wanting desperately to stay with us, but knew their skills were essential, to help keep the ship in one piece. It was a horrible moment. They tried to reassure us, and told us to stay in our family quarters, promising they would return for us, as quickly as they could. Mom was very emotional. I was terrified. I really didn't want them to go, even though I knew they had to. But poor Danny, was far beyond understanding. He was hysterical. I remember helping Dad to peel his panicked, clinging arms, from around Mom, holding on to him. I had to pin him down on the floor, so they could get away. Mom was clearly upset, as she very reluctantly left the room with Dad, both probably wondering whether it would be the last time they would see us. Tragically, it was. The door closed behind them, and I held on to Danny tightly, while he struggled with unexpected strength, lashing out, screaming hysterically for Mom. Despite my own terror, Danny gave me something to focus on, and I remained able to function. I concentrated on trying to calm him, stroking his hair, and reassuring him calmly, that everything was going to be okay. It was working, until my words were suddenly drowned out, by another huge explosion. The entire ship shuddered, the lights went out, and we were plunged into total darkness, forcing us both into an even deeper, state of terror. In that moment, I genuinely believed the ship would explode, and we would die. I knew how to abandon ship. 
I even knew how to program a lifeboat to fly, and how to operate the communication equipment, even Danny did. It was standard procedure for everyone on board to be trained with basic survival knowledge and skills, but it wouldn't have done us any good. In that moment, we were both so terror-stricken, neither of us could move. I couldn't even recall my name, had someone asked me for it. My thoughts and actions, completely disabled, by the darkest, most dreadful, all-encompassing fear, I had ever experienced in my life. The intense sense of mortal dread, lingered for few moments, before a numbing, sinister dark mist, began to swirl into my vision, overwhelming my mind, and forcing everything into a black, forbidding silence. I don't know how long I lay there on my side, before I was able to move or think again. I think I had passed out, probably for quite a while, because the first thing I noticed, was how dark and quiet everything was. I felt groggy and nauseous, but my memory started coming back to me, and I remembered I had been struggling to hold on to Danny while mom and dad left the room. It was too dark to see much, but I felt something warm lying immediately in front of me, and a weight pressing down on my left arm. It was Danny. I still had my arms wrapped around him, but he was not struggling anymore he was not moving at all. I propped myself up, and looked at his face. In the dim light, I could see his eyes were closed. He was breathing, and just seemed to be asleep. I quietly called him a few times, and he stirred, then quickly became upset again, but he didn't struggle this time. I suddenly felt bad, realizing I probably should have left him to sleep. I hugged him tightly, comforting him calming him, to a point where I could try to think about what we should do. I attempted to stand up in the darkness, but immediately smacked my head against something solid above me. I yelped out in pain, and came crashing back to the floor, grasping my stinging forehead. Moments later, I felt a wet, warm, slippery sensation, between my hand and face. I knew it was my blood. A sense of alarm came over me again, as my heart started racing. Danny caught a glimpse of my face in the faint light, and he gasped. I knew it was bad, but to my surprise, he didn't panic. He calmly reached into his pocket, and pulled out a tissue, which he gave to me, and I pressed it onto the gash on my head. I could feel my panic starting to set in again. I was completely terrified, we both were, but I realized my time with the guards was helping me cope better with the fear. After the coaching they had given me, especially during martial arts training, which included meditation. I took a few deep breaths, just as the guards had taught me, and was able to calm myself a little. I had the presence of mind to reach up, and find out what I had hit my head on. That's when I discovered the ceiling, and large chunks of bulkhead, were at arm's length above our heads. Further feeling around in the darkness, revealed that the room had collapsed around us, and we appeared to be trapped next to a structural beam. I realized we had been extremely lucky not to be crushed by it. Trying to remain calm, I attempted to assess our situation, we were both alive, and the ship no longer appeared to be under attack, so in my mind, that was a good thing. But whether anyone else was alive, or what our chances of being rescued were, I had no clue. I realized the artificial gravity generators, were still working, which I assumed was a good sign, because that meant major elements of the ship, were likely still operational. I could also hear the humming sound of an emergency force field in place nearby, which meant that power was still being supplied to this area of the ship. However, I also knew it meant there was a hull breach somewhere nearby. This raised the anxiety levels once again. I knew emergency force fields took a lot of power to maintain. That meant if the power failed at any point, the force field would fail, and we would both die almost instantly, exposed to the harsh, freezing vacuum of space. These terrifying thoughts could have easily consumed me again, but I tried hard not to think about it, and concentrated all my energy, on trying to get us out of there. After more attempts to move, 
and cutting my hand on something sharp behind me, I soon realized we really were stuck. It appeared we were in a small pocket about a meter tall, and no bigger than the area of a single bed. The room appeared to have collapsed around us, yet miraculously, it had not crushed us. I decided at that point, we had been extremely lucky. Chapter 4 For almost a whole day, Danny and I remained huddled together in the tiny survival pocket, terrified out of our minds, not knowing if anyone else had survived, if we would be rescued, or if we would die there. After what felt like an eternity, hope came, in the form of calling voices. I'm not exaggerating, when I say, it was the sweetest sound I had ever heard. The surviving crew had managed to restore some of the ship's functions, including the biometric sensors, and had detected us. It took a rescue team a while to cut their way through the debris in order to reach us, without the room caving in any further. I was later told, that they originally tried to reduce the artificial gravity during the rescue, in order to minimize the danger to us, but the controlling mechanisms, were no longer functional. The gash on my head never fully stopped bleeding and there was blood all down my clothes, which made it look worse, than it actually was. Thankfully Danny wasn't physically injured, but he was very traumatized by the whole experience. Combined with exhaustion, dehydration, and a lack of sustenance, we were both in worse shape than I thought. When released from our tomb-like prison, we could barely stand or walk. It seems our rescue caused something of a mini-celebration, among the surviving crew. News of it, became a tiny thread of hope that emerged, from a seemingly hopeless situation. But I didn't feel much like celebrating. We were soon told that mom and dad were missing. I may have been only 14 at the time, but I wasn't that naive. I knew the words, presumed dead, had been tactfully omitted from the conversation. After our rescue, we were carried to a makeshift gathering area, where we were treated. From then on, information only presented itself, in broken snippets. Most of it came from various conversations I could overhear, while drifting in and out of consciousness. I pieced together, that we were in an intact part of the ship, one of many pockets throughout the ship, that had survived the attack. Many of these areas were cut off from each other, but the surviving crew members were able to communicate via wireless communication systems, and were concentrating their efforts on emergency repairs, and finding other survivors. We appeared to be the only two people receiving medical treatment, in the room we were in. At the time, I didn't get the name of the nice lady, who was tending my injuries, but I recall her saying, that there were about 30 survivors in our little pocket of the ship. Most of them were working on repairs, and trying to find other survivors. At first, in my still somewhat dazed state, I didn't fully understand where we had been taken. It appeared we were in a narrow room, that intersected with other compartmentalized areas. I was lying down on some sort of soft cushion material, but it wasn't a bed, as such. It was more like a long seat. Danny was laying on a similar seat arrangement on the opposite side of the room, just a few feet away from me. The nice lady explained to me, that we were in one of Fusion's, lifeboats. There were 16 lifeboat stations situated all over the Fusion. Each station was a large rectangular docking area, for 8 lifeboats, small independent ships, used in emergencies, in case we ever had to abandon ship. There were four lifeboats docked on either side of each station. She was using one of the docked lifeboats, as a makeshift treatment room for us. That's the last thing I remember, before exhaustion and numbness, caused me to fall into a deep, haunting sleep. I awoke, to the feeling of my hair, being gently stroked. I could hear a faint thrumming sound in the background, and I could sense slight movement, or vibration through the surface I was laying on. I took a deep breath, and began to open my eyes. The brightness of the overhead lights, caused them to hurt, as I opened them. 
A kind voice spoke. It was the lady who had treated me in the escape pod. Her name was Kim, by the way. Thank goodness, she said softly, still stroking my hair in a reassuring gesture. It felt very soothing. You've been asleep over 15 hours, she spoke softly, how do you feel? It felt strange, hearing I had been asleep for so long, but in the context of everything that had happened, little could surprise me anymore. My head stings a bit, I replied in a croaky voice, as I reached up to feel some large wound dressings, on my forehead and temple. Your head might be a bit sore for a while, but don't worry, you're okay. You're going to be just fine, she reassured. I looked around at my surroundings. I was still laying down on the bench seat in the lifeboat. Kim was sat on the same seat, next to my head. I looked over at Danny. He was fast asleep on the opposite bench, covered over with a blanket. Is Danny alright? I asked. Kim explained he was fine, and had only just recently fallen asleep. He's been so worried about you, hasn't left your side, she added, he'll be very glad you've woken up. As I got more of my bearings, I suddenly realized that the lifeboat's main hatch was closed. Are we in flight? I asked in a puzzled tone. Kim nodded affirmatively. Why? I asked, trying to sit up, but my strength had left me, and I flopped back down again. She explained what had happened, while helping me to sit upright on the bench seat. The Zeros came back and attacked again, she explained, suddenly sounding upset. I could see she was close to tears. There was no warning. One of their weapons struck close to our lifeboat station, but I was able to launch us in time, and we escaped. I was shocked at hearing her words. What about the others? I asked feeling an intense anxiety rapidly rising up, and tightening in my throat. I don't know who else survives, I've been trying for hours, but haven't been able to raise anyone on the comms, Kim replied. But what about the fusion? I bleated, not really wanting to hear her answer, already suspecting it might be something beyond terrible. Tears welled up in her eyes and rolled down her cheeks. She's gone. She gasped in a whisper. Gone? I mewled anxiously, my voice now clearly showing my rising, inner panic. Kim was beginning to lose control of her composure. The ship exploded, she sobbed, there's nothing left. I could feel that, now familiar, sense of dark, mortal dread, rising up from the pit of my stomach again, as my panic finally went, full-blown. Mom and Dad? I squealed, and started panting in a panic. Tears began to pour down my cheeks, as the most devastating, life-changing terror, and deepest sadness, completely overwhelmed my entire being. In that single moment, I could feel my entire world, everything I had ever known, come crashing down around me. I suddenly felt dizzy, and nauseous, and what little strength I had seemed to be suddenly yanked away from me. I thought I might pass out again. Kim watched the color rapidly draining from my face, and she stepped in, and grabbed me, stopping me from falling face first onto the floor. She held and hugged me tightly, as I began wailing loudly, and breathlessly, burying my face into my palms. We shared our devastation together. I'm so sorry, she sobbed in a whisper gently stroking my hair again, trying her best to comfort me as I cried and sobbed, grieving uncontrollably. My wailing woke Danny. Although Kim hadn't told him fully what the situation was, trying to protect his already ravaged mind from the truth, he had quietly worked out for himself, what he thought was going on. Until then though, in his mind, it was only one possible scenario of many, so he had chosen to remain optimistic. However, seeing my uncontrollable sobbing, finally drove home, the cold hard reality of our truth, confirming his worst fears, and sending him into a tailspin of collapsing emotions. Moments later, 
all three of us were clinging tightly onto each other, wailing and sobbing our hearts out, as together, we faced the profoundly sad, and terrifying reality, of our new existence. Chapter 5 We grieved, until we were all cried out, and our tears had run dry. Still huddled together for comfort, and reassurance, we became quiet and calm, all of us dwelling in a numbness, where, emotionally, we no longer knew what we felt. Everything felt so surreal, distant and empty, like in a bad dream. For a while, my body didn't seem like it was my own, and it felt like I was observing everything, through different eyes, that were floating above my head. From within this new surreality, I felt myself constantly contemplating what life now meant for us, or if our lives would even continue at all. It took a while for me to start thinking straight again, but when I did, I started feeling strangely proactive, as if suddenly empowered to take action, and try to do something about our situation. I think my mind was looking for distractions, something else to occupy it, so it didn't have to dwell on the unthinkable thoughts it was trying so hard, to both dismiss, and simultaneously process. Still huddled up to Danny and Kim. I scanned my eyes around the small room we were in. Is it really just the three of us now? I asked. Kim nodded, reluctantly, I think it might be, she whispered calmly. What will we do? I asked, my worried voice starting to rise again, where will we go? Shh, don't worry, it's alright, she gently reassured, still hugging us both tightly. We're on course for a planet that should be safe for us to land on. It has an atmosphere, a temperate climate, and can comfortably sustain us. But then what? I asked. Well, then we build a long-range transmitter, and get a signal back to Earth, to let them know what has happened. She replied. Then we wait for rescue. I had no idea, Earth, had another ship capable of rescuing us. But Kim's confident words, suddenly gave me hope, that we might be okay after all. The truth, I later found out, was, that Earth definitely would not be able to rescue us. She was only telling me those things, to keep me from worrying further. Our target destination, however, the planet, was real. I could see it on the display console. It was still over two months away. So we all settled down, and got comfy for the long journey ahead. Over the course of the following weeks, life on board the lifeboat, fell into a gentle routine, as we did whatever we could to make our situation seem more bearable. Danny and I grew very close to Kim, and we got to learn a lot more about each other. She was a science officer in the Space Corps, and had boarded the Fusion with her husband, who was also a scientist stationed on the ship. During our time together, we became like a tightly knit family, all of us closely bonded through our shared fear, deeply felt grief, and intense, devastating sense of loss. Kim was instrumental in helping maintain our sanity during that terrifying time, she was a compassionate soul, but also very confident, and competent. She was an accomplished scientist, vastly knowledgeable, and had been heavily involved in the original design and construction of many of the fusions, functional systems. Just the way she carried and projected herself, went a long way to instilling confidence, and reassurance, and most importantly, hope, into me and Danny. We came to look upon her as a kind of, surrogate big sister, and we quickly grew to respect, love, and trust her, during our time together in the lifeboat. Our lifeboat had a name, Nimrod. Designed to carry 12 people, she was reasonably spacious, and had all the essentials we needed to survive, for prolonged periods. There were shower and bathroom facilities, as well as a place for us to sleep, bunks, housed in a separate compartment from the living areas. Food and other necessities, were provided through matter replication, with propulsion and power, being supplied by a quantum fusion, singularity drive, or QFS drive a truly remarkable device that would provide all the power we would ever need, indefinitely. 
Despite everything that had happened, at least in one respect, we were in good shape. The Nimrod was able to sustain all three of us, for as long as we needed her too, for years if necessary. She was built tough, was fast and nimble. However, no matter how good she was, she simply didn't have the capability, to get us home. One of the reasons the Starship Fusion was built so big, was to accommodate the enormous size, of the power generation systems, required to achieve faster than light speed. The QFS drive, powering lifeboat Nimrod, might have seemed impressive, but it was simply not powerful enough to produce anywhere near the kind of speed we needed, to get home, at least not in our lifetimes. Kim calculated, that even with the Nimrod traveling at full speed, continuously for five years, we would barely cover 1% of the distance, back to Earth. It was in week 4, that things got scary again. We suddenly came under attack. We were all asleep in our bunks, when the attack came, suddenly awoken by an almighty bang, as the first weapon's fire, hit the Nimrod's hull. In a startled panic, we all leapt out of bed. Kim commanded us to come with her. She grabbed our hands, and we all ran, barefoot, in just our sleepwear, towards the bridge. Kim threw herself into the main pilot's seat, and began strapping in. Quickly, sit there and buckle up. She commanded, gesturing towards the twin seats, set just a few feet behind the main pilot's seat. Both me and Danny, leapt onto the seats, and fastened our restraints as quickly as we could, while Kim took manual control of the ship, and began scanning for the attacker. I managed to get my seat harness fastened quickly, but Danny was panicking and fumbling with his. I leaned in, and managed to click it closed just in time, before the whole ship shook from another hit. Danny's panicked hands clamped around my arm, and we clung tightly onto each other, in terror, as we watched Kim spring into action. She glanced around, to make sure we were definitely buckled up in our seats. Hold on tight you two, she spoke urgently, yet calmly, it might get a bit bumpy. She turned back to the controls, and punched some overhead switches, firing up the maneuvering engines, and promptly throwing the Nimrod into a series of random moves, in an attempt to shake off the attacker, and avoid us getting hit again. Don't worry, boys, called Kim. These lifeboats are built extra tough, Nimrod will protect us, she can take quite a beating, and she can kick ass, if she needs to. Her words were intended to ease some of our obvious panic, but with the alien ship still shooting at us, it wasn't working much. She punched more switches, and we heard the whirring, from the defensive weapon systems, deploying, beam gun turrets, suddenly popping up, all over the hull. Simultaneously, Kim was trying to identify, and gather data on our assailant, using the ship's scanners. An image of a ship, similar to those that attacked and destroyed the fusion, appeared on one of the screens. Looks like the zeros again? said Kim. She seemed surprisingly calm, as her years of training took over, her actions and demeanor, suddenly becoming very measured. The alien ship opened up its weapons on us again, and we could all hear those same, exact, terrifying gun sounds, we had all heard when the fusion was being attacked. Kim activated Nimrod's defensive weapons, and returned fire. The ship echoed with the loud popping sounds of our beam cannons discharging multiple volleys of pulses. We landed a few hits, but they were mostly ineffective against the other ship. They appeared to be dissipated by some kind of energy shielding, that surrounded it. The sensors were showing, it was about three times the size of Nimrod. Speed-wise, we couldn't seem to outrun it either, but Nimrod was nimble enough to move around quickly, and minimize any weapon hits on us. However, after nearly ten minutes of trying to dodge the incoming weapons fire, there was no escaping the fact, we were slowly taking damage, and were not going to last forever. We took another direct hit. This time, with what seemed like a lot more force. Damn, gasped Kim. They've increased their weapon power levels? 
The whole ship shook again. Damn it! Kim cursed again, as she urgently punched keys at the helm controls, trying to keep us out of the line of fire. Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, a new proximity alert suddenly prompted our eyes to the scanner screen, where a much, much larger vessel, had suddenly appeared, and was rapidly moving to intercept us. Where the hell did that come from? gasped Kim. Her voice finally hinting that she wasn't as calm as she'd been trying to project. The new ship was gigantic. Over half a mile across, and it was headed straight for us, looming up behind the attacking ship, that continued firing at us, as we struggled to get away. Our assumption was, that the attacking ship must have been a scout vessel from the giant ship. We realized, we wouldn't stand a chance fighting against such a formidable force. Our only hope, seemed to be, in trying to get away from them. As Kim tried to maximize power to the engines, we were suddenly hit by a long volley of weapons fire from the attacking ship. The Nimrod immediately fell silent, all our systems shut down, and we were plunged into darkness. The only light source, was now coming from the stars themselves. The whole flight deck, was bathed in a dim bluish glow of starlight, coming in through the large front windows. Damn! Kim cursed. We were dead in the water. The proverbial sitting duck. Our systems were down, we had no power, no engines, no defensive capabilities and no weapons. The sudden silence felt deafening. Me and Danny, terrified, and still clinging onto each other, afraid for our lives, watched and listened in the darkness, as Kim frantically punched keys, twisted and fumbled at levers, in a desperate hope of bringing the power back online. She threw off her seat harness, and quickly ran to an inspection panel, at one side of the bridge. She lifted it away, and peered into the small round view hole located behind it. Moments later, she gave a deep sigh, and then a sniff, as her hope, and her world, quickly crumbled away. Although I couldn't see her eyes, from the sound of her sniffing, I knew she'd started crying. She didn't say anything to us about what she'd seen, but I knew what inspection panel she was looking at, and I quickly started to realize, that the QFS drive, our whole source of power, was dead. I didn't understand the hows, or the whys, but I knew a quantum fusion singularity drive, once stopped, was lost forever, completely impossible to restart. As far as I was aware, the science also dictated that these drives, were virtually impossible to shut down, yet, here we were. Kim quietly moved over, and knelt on the floor in front of our seat. Come here you two, she whispered, her voice seemed upset and despondent, although she was trying hard not to show it. She reached her arms around both of us, and started cuddling and comforting us, in a very emotional group hug. We all held on tightly to each other, drawing comfort, united in our fear. I couldn't help feel the panic rising in me, as I sensed that Kim, genuinely thought this was the end for all three of us, and she was just waiting for the enemy ship to finish us off. Between her quiet sniffs, she whispered soothing, reassuring, loving words to both of us, trying to keep us both calm, as Danny and I quietly sobbed, both of us shaking in terror, as we started to figure out what was about to happen. As we clung onto each other tightly, through tearful eyes, I kept peering over Kim's shoulder, through the flight deck main windows, and into the starry abyss. I watched the attacking ship turn, and slowly take its final approach toward us. Now shuddering with the most extreme fear I had ever experienced in my life, my sobbing and panic increased, as I watched two weapon turrets on its hull start to illuminate, quickly glowing brighter, until suddenly, it launched a pair of bright, fast-moving missiles, straight toward us. Genuinely believing death was imminent, an involuntary shriek of terror escaped my lips, as I clamped onto Danny and Kim as tightly as I could. In that exact moment, there came a piercing, deafening roar, followed by a blinding flash of light, that lit up the entire flight deck. 
We all screamed in terror, thinking this was it. A moment later, the attacking ship, and the two missiles, exploded, in spectacular style. Chapter 6 Still being hugged tightly by Kim, I continue to peer over her shoulder, out of the flight deck windows. The attacking ship was now violently disintegrating in a bright fireball, casting flaming debris in all directions. I watched, still in terror, but dumbstruck, my cries of fear suddenly muted, distracted by the extraordinary event I was now witnessing. With a rumble from its huge engines, the massive, second ship we detected, suddenly came into view, gliding quickly over the top of Nimrod, its enormous hull, progressively blotting out our view of the stars. Kim was kneeling with her back toward the windows, still holding on to us tightly, anticipating our demise at any moment. The sound of the rumbling engines, suddenly pulled her from her resignation to die, and she turned her head, looking through the windows. My god! She gasped, glimpsing the gleaming white underbelly of the massive ship, that by then, had fully blocked our view of the stars. Kim tried to pull away from us, but in our terror, neither me, or Danny, were ready to let her go. It's okay, she calmly reassured us, I promise, I'm not going anywhere, but I need to see this. We reluctantly eased our grip, and she carefully unpeeled herself from our still terrified clinging arms. She got up, and hurried to the window to get a better look. Danny automatically redirected his grip towards me, and we clung onto each other tightly again, both of us desperately looking to Kim, for some glimmer of hopeful news. I think the big ship destroyed the attacking one? I managed to stutter, my voice breathless and trembling, maybe they're rescuing us. Until that moment, intense, mortal terror, was the only emotion I was feeling, but when I heard myself saying those words, I suddenly felt a tiny glimmer of hope begin to spark within my mind. Kim was trying to comprehend what was happening and what we could, or should, do, working out what possible options, if any, may have just opened up to us. She desperately wanted to invest in my suggestion that we were being rescued and she seemed more optimistic now, that our situation appeared to have shifted from, certain death, to might possibly live? But, as a scientist, and as a grown-up, the more cautious side of her thinking, was still very much the dominant factor. Her mind was already conjuring up the worst kind of imagery, of us being held captive, enslaved, or experimented upon? Or worse, disemboweled or eaten? by whomever or whatever was on that ship. The unknowns made it infinitely more terrifying, than a simple death from our ship being destroyed. I continued sitting there, observing Kim. Clearly she still seemed very anxious, and I didn't know what she was thinking or planning. She quickly moves over to the co-pilot's seat and reached under the console, fumbling for something for a moment, then she pulled out a pistol. It was a beam weapon the same as the ones Chuck and the other guards had taught me to fire. I could see it was set to maximum power. Despite conquering my fear of beam weapons, seeing it in Kim's hand, significantly raised my anxiety levels again. She glanced at me, and could see the resurgence of fear in my questioning eyes. Don't worry, she reassured, suddenly shrouding her anxiety, in a fake calmness. She knew if she acted calmly, it will go a long way to help prevent me and Danny from becoming too panicked again. She tucked the gun into her belt behind her back. It's just a precaution? For defense? But we'll be fine, I'm sure we won't need it. Despite her sudden projection of a calm demeanor, Kim had quickly worked out there were only likely to be one of two outcomes to this scenario, either we were being rescued, or we were being captured. She realized, with Nimrod's power source gone, and zero chance of ever reviving it, we were now completely at the mercy of whomever, or whatever, was on that ship. If we were being captured, it was reasonable to assume there was no way we would be able to avoid it, or escape any subsequent horrors that might potentially follow, except for one thing, obviously she didn't tell us, 
but Kim had intended the pistol to be a last resort for the three of us, if things didn't go well. With the beam gun set to full power, she knew it would be an instantaneous and painless death, total vaporization within a fraction of a second. She figured if she judged it right, she could get us both with a single shot, so we wouldn't know anything about it. Just thinking such thoughts, was so horrific to her, it made her feel intensely nauseous, and she gagged, almost throwing up. In normal circumstances, even the hint of such an idea would have been unthinkable to her, yet, in the context of what was happening, it actually seemed a viable option to prevent us from potentially suffering a fate, worse than death. Her biggest concern now, was determining what circumstances would actually confirm to her, that such an unthinkable act was required, and whether or not she would have the courage to go through with it. Kim could feel these hellish thoughts starting to run rampant through her mind, tearing at her sanity. She knew she needed to reel things back and get a grip, before they drove her to destruction. She glanced back at me and Danny, seeing us, still huddled together in terror. It was a powerful reminder to her, that she still had a reason to not give up yet. Kim loved us, dearly. In the time we had spent together, through our shared experiences, we had become closer than family, our bonds to each other, thicker than blood. She looked upon us, as the kid brothers she never had, and we adored and loved her, like an older sister. Our love and loyalty to each other had become unbreakable. Seeing us both in such a helpless and terrified state, Kim felt something in her heart explode, giving her renewed strength and determination, to protect us, and to try to make things right. She consciously set aside the diabolical ideas she had been having, opting now, to try to start thinking a little more optimistically, after all, a few minutes ago, she had expected all of us to die, but here we were, all still very much alive. Her plan for the immediate future, was to proceed with the assumption, or at least the faint hope, that this, was a rescue. Chapter 7 Despite Kim's newly found optimism, the truly awful thoughts she had been having, continue to periodically intrude into her mind, as she paced the flight deck, trying to figure out what to do next. I could see from her facial expressions, the wrestling match with her own thoughts, clearly going on inside her head. Thankfully, I didn't know what she was thinking about at that time. In that moment I was more concerned with trying to comfort and reassure Danny, who seemed to be rapidly withdrawing into a silent, traumatized stupor. I stroked his hair. Danny? Danny? I called calmly. He didn't reply. Just continued staring blankly ahead. It seemed the intense and overwhelming trauma we had all just experienced, had taken its toll on his mind. Something's wrong with Danny? I called to her, my voice starting to panic. He's not right? Kim came over, crouching back down. She tried to rouse him but his blank stare remained. Not knowing what else to do, we both just held on to him in another group hug, continuing to offer whatever comfort we could. As we sat there, cuddling silently in the darkness, suddenly, from deep within my mind, I felt something powerful happening. It was like someone, or something, was intruding into my mind. It is difficult to describe in words, but it felt like, Suddenly, I wasn't alone, or rather, I wasn't the only conscious presence inside my own head. I wondered if, like Danny, my own intense state of fear and intimidation, was playing tricks with my brain, and that I was perhaps hallucinating, or was about to pass out again, like I did on the fusion when she was first attacked by the Zeros, but this was very different. I could feel my panicked state of fear subsiding, starting to fall away. For some unknown reason, I was actually calming down, and I could feel my mind start to think more clearly. This strange presence seemed to shift, moving further into the forefront of my consciousness. I focused hard, trying to work out once and for all, if this was my own imagination, but it wasn't me. A stream of consciousness and thoughts, that were definitely not my own, began entering and flowing more freely through my mind. 
These powerful feelings were then suddenly accompanied by a strange sound, not quite a voice, more like harmonious waves of white noise, with the cadence and rhythmic pattern of a speaking human voice. By now, I was completely convinced this was not my own imagination, or some kind of hallucination, or brain injury. Someone or something, some outside influence, had gone inside my mind, and was reaching out to me. I should have been freaking out, but I wasn't. In fact, I never felt more calm in my life, which I suppose, under the circumstances, should have freaked me out even more. Instead, I started feeling really strong, deep emotions, feelings of hope and love, towards, well, towards everything, and everyone. The whole experience felt emotionally beautiful, like an angel of light was reaching out to me, and whispering gentle, reassuring, loving words into my ear. Then it came. A voice, as clearly as anyone stood right next to me, and speaking into my ear. Do not be afraid, my child. You are safe now. It was a beautiful softly spoken female voice, angelic and in perfect English. I was very confused. Did you hear that? I gasped. Hear what? replied Kim. That voice? Kim shook her head negatively. You're hearing voices? No, just one, I replied, sounding puzzled. A lady. Kim suddenly looked worried, as if what I had told her meant something bad. Only you can hear me, at the moment, came the soft voice again inside my head. And do not worry about your brother, he is going to be alright, we are helping him now. I don't understand? Who are you, how do you know he's my brother? What are you doing to Danny? I spoke aloud, as if conversing urgently with the empty space in front of me. I'm not doing anything to Danny, replied Kim, looking confused. Lucas, you're not making any sense, what are you talking about? No, not you, Kim, I'm talking to the lady I can hear in my mind, I replied matter-of-factly. Kim suddenly looked very concernedly at me, thinking my mind may have started to crack under the pressure. Lucas, you're starting to scare me, she whispered, there is nobody else in here, just the three of us. Before I had a chance to reply, the angelic voice spoke again. Do not worry, Lucas, this may all seem very strange to you, but let me explain. I am in the ship above you. I am communicating with your mind telepathically. We are a peaceful race of beings, and we wish you no harm. We discovered what happened to your mothership, the fusion, and we have come to offer you our help. We are here for you to help you, if you choose to let us. It's okay, you should go ahead and tell your companions what I have just told you. I looked at Kim, it's the other ship, I explained calmly, they're communicating telepathically with me. They say they know about the fusion, and they want to help us. Kim gasped, bringing her hands up to her mouth in shock and disbelief. What I told her was so, out there? She clearly didn't know whether to believe me. Were these the rambling imaginations of a boy losing his mind? Or was it actually true? The voice returned. I understand this is a lot for you to take in, and we were hoping there would be more time for us to establish a higher level of communication and trust between us, before progressing further, but we know your ship is damaged, and vending atmosphere. We detect your life support systems will not sustain you much longer. With your permission, we will bring you aboard our ship, and offer you sanctuary. Please explain this to your companions. I relayed the message as accurately as I could to Kim. On hearing my words, she suddenly seemed a lot more convinced that this was real. She had already noticed the sound of venting atmosphere, but hadn't said anything, so as not to alarm us. She continued mulling over all possibilities in her mind, still wondering if this was some kind of trap or subterfuge. They seem, and feel, really friendly, 
I added, I think we're going to be okay. We don't really have a choice anyway, Kim replied, Nimrod is dead, and we need their help. You should all be seated, there may be some buffeting, came the angelic voice once more. There will be a soft light, do not be alarmed, this is just our way of guiding your vessel into our ship. Once again, I relayed the information back to Kim, and she checked we were still strapped securely into our seats, before she strapped herself into the pilot seat. A few moments later, a soft beam of light, enveloped the Nimrod. The whole ship jolted for a moment. We all looked through the windows, and could see a massive hatchway opening up in the belly of the ship above us, and within moments, we were inside what was essentially, a giant spaceship hangar. So that is my story, of how we came to be living on board a giant alien spacecraft, heading back toward Earth. A lot has happened between that day, the day of our rescue, and now. And there is so much to tell you, about the wonderful beings who saved us, about their ways, their technologies, about how they live, and how they look. But that, is all for another day, and another story. The End if you enjoyed my work, I would love to receive a comment from you. Perhaps you could let me know if you'd like me to write a part 2. Thanks, and have a great day!